So, throughout this series, we're going to ask one very important question. We're going to attempt to answer, what must someone believe in order to be a faithful follower of Jesus? What must someone believe in order for them to be a faithful follower of Jesus? And it it sounds a simple enough um, question, you know, if Christianity is a faith based thing, if it's a faith-based way of life, surely we already know what it is that we must believe in order to be part of that. Surely we must already know what what, what, uh, being a follower of Jesus is all about. But the challenge with Christianity is the Christian faith has been going for over 2,000 years, and there's over 2 billion people that make up this movement all across the the world. It it becomes complicated um, because all of those people and all of those traditions and all of that that heritage and that culture um, and all of those different cultures. Actually, we we approach things very differently. And and one thing we recognize is that we're all human. Uh, We all do things in a slightly different way. And the thing that we all have in common is we think that our way is the right way. Just think about how you make um, a cup of tea. Now, we all make different cups of tea, uh, and you think your way is the right way until you come across somebody who makes it in a completely different way to you, and you think, oh my word, they are complete heathens for doing that. Who puts milk in before the hot water uh, in, in tea? Some people, and people think, no, that's an awful way to do that. Uh, it, I, I get very passionate about tea. Uh, we're British in those things. And, and you know, we have a different way to, to doing things like tea, or what about the game of Monopoly? Who likes Monopoly? It's a great game. It's been destroying marriages for 50 years. Um, every single person or every family that I come across has a different way to play Monopoly. You know what? I've never met anybody who plays Monopoly the way it's supposed to be played. Because we all have our own rules, don't we? We all have our own variations. We played a game of Monopoly with people recently who played it in a stupid way. I mean, I just can't, I'm just i really questioning whether we could be friends with them uh, anymore. No, you know, when you land on the tax squares um, or community chess or, or chance and you have to pay a fine, where, where does the money go? Who says it goes in the bank? No! It does not go in the bank. It goes on free, it goes in the center of the board. And then when you land on free parking, you collect the money. They wouldn't let us do that. I was outraged. I mean, what on earth is going on? You know, do these people not know how to play Monopoly and all that money put it in the bank? It says in the rules. It says in the rules. I mean, I don't know. Anyway. You know, we all have our own way of doing things. We all have our own way of approaching things, you know. And if this is true with inconsequential things like tea and monopoly, and yes, I did say tea is inconsequential. Please do not not stone me. Well, what happens with the Christian faith? Well, exactly the same thing. You know, the Christian faith is broken up into various denominations, various different groups or or, um, organizations of people who all have their own sort of way of of approaching things. They all have their own sort of approach to to how to follow Jesus and and what this is um, all about, you know, how to do things, how to believe things, what what to say. How many denominations or Christian denominations do you think there are um, in the world? You can talk to me. This is live. Six, more than, give me a guess, so a thousand, more than a thousand, three thousand, more than three thousand. Not that high, don't be so ridiculous, 56,000, I, I don't know, it sounds like an auction where three thousand. There's around about, or just over 45,000, you were close, fair enough, there you go, but you know, you're, <laughs> we went from 3,000 to 56,000, what's that, what's that about? There's over 45,000 different Christian denominations um, across the world. That's 45,000 different ways to approach the same things. That's 45,000 different practices, different theologies, different traditions, different expectations. That's 45,000 or maybe right, you know, different ways to interpret the Bible. And the thing that all of these denominations have in common is every single one of them believes that their way 
is the right way. That the way that we do things is the correct things. The things that we believe in is the correct things. The things that we put priority in is the correct thing. Everyone else is wrong, or everyone else is partially wrong. Everyone else has been misinformed, or everybody else has been misled. And the reality is, we are all probably wrong about some things. I'm sure there's things that, that we do, um, at FBC, that perhaps are, uh, are not um, at the core of what the Christian faith is. But the important thing is, are we right about the right things? Are we right about the important things? Are we right about the main things? Are we right about what is fundamental? You know, what is indispensable? What is necessary? What is crucial? What are the things that are central? What are the things that are required in order to be uh, a faithful follower of Jesus. That's what this series is all about. This is a really important question. We need to know these things if we want to know if Christianity is for us. We need to know these things if we want to be faithful followers of Jesus. But also important to this question is this question. You know, what is peripheral? What are the things that are cultural? What are the things that are traditional? What are the things that we've done because we've always done them? They're just the way things are. What are the things that are fashionable that we do them because it seems everybody else is doing things and they look cool, so let's adopt those things. And actually, what are the things that, that we adopt that are harmful, that are actually uh, damaging? You know, a lot of these things, peripheral things, cultural things, traditional things, they're important. It doesn't mean that they're bad or, or that they're wrong. But the, the crucial thing is that they're not fundamental. They're not things that we have to put center stage. Yeah, we can have them and they can be an important part of who we are and what we do, but they're not fundamental to being a faithful follower of Jesus. It's okay to adopt those practices. It's okay to adopt those habits. It's okay to have those those beliefs, some of those beliefs, as long as they're not harmful or dangerous, uh, as long as they're things that we've not brought in uh, from culture around us that is actually pulling us away uh, from what it means to be a follower of Jesus, or is actually difficult or damaging the people around us. So in this series, we're going to try and explore some of these things to help us hold tightly to the things that are fundamentally, and to hold loosely, I suppose, to the things that are peripheral, and, and hopefully to let go of those things if there's anything that is damaging. Um, and, you know, so you've probably heard this, this phrase, um, don't throw the baby out with the, the bathwater. That's a part of the thing that we're going to look at. The earliest record um, of this phrase comes from uh, back in 1512. There's a book by a guy called Thomas Muller called Appeal to Fools. And, and in this, sort of, this, this book, there was this woodcut illustration of a, a lady throwing a baby out with the bathwater. And you know the meaning of the phrase is, you know, don't throw something good out with something that is bad. Don't throw something good out with something that needs to be discovered. Don't throw something that's fundamental out with something that is peripheral. Here's a, another way to interpret this phrase. In your zeal to rid yourself of something unwanted or harmful, don't inadvertently rid yourself of something valuable and important. And the reason why we're talking about this here is um, the story of many people, when it, when it comes to faith, um, uh, people who have discarded their faith is because they've been involved or immersed or, or adopted practices or traditions or even beliefs that are not fundamental, things that are secondary, things that are cultural or traditional, things that are fashionable, or even actually things that are harmful and realize, actually, I don't want to do that. I don't want to be part of that. I don't want to believe in that. And I've heard many stories of people who reject their faith, who throw out their faith because they want to throw out this part of their Christian tradition. And in doing so, they throw out the fundamental things, the important things, the things that are, are valuable. And maybe that's you. Maybe you've had a negative experience of church. Maybe you've had a negative experience um, of faith. Maybe you were told you had to do something that you didn't want to do, or you had to believe something that you didn't want to believe. Maybe you were told you had to believe that the world was created in six days, and, and your science teacher presented a different view, an alternative view that your faith couldn't answer. Or maybe you are told you had to give 10% um, of your salary um, to the church, and, and you didn't want to do that, and you struggled uh, with that. 
that. Um, or, or maybe you, you were told you had to do something um, that was a bit more harmful, a bit more, more damaging. Maybe um, a partner, a husband or a wife uh, was having a, an affair with somebody and you were told you had to submit to them because you know, marriage is the highest authority. Or, or there's things, you know, you can fill in the blanks. I've heard so many stories of people who've encountered these difficult, these um, peripheral, these cultural, these traditional, even harmful things and actually told you must believe this, you must do this, you must think uh, like this. If you want to be a follower of Jesus, you must do this. And think, well, I don't want to do that. It doesn't square with my worldview. And so I'm going to disregard everything. Uh, and then, you know, they, they, they rid themselves of something that actually was important. You know, these things that were secondary, they were peripheral, they, they were cultural. Um, and in some cases, as I said, they were wrong, they, they were harmful. But the problem was they were put, they were elevated to center stage, they were elevated to primary status. Uh, these things that are on the fringes, these things that are on the periphery were actually brought right into the center. Uh, and maybe that's your story. Maybe you're told you have to think like this, you have to to believe like this, all of the, these things, if you want to be a follower of Jesus. And you're like, well, yeah, I, I'm on board with that. I'm on board with that. Yeah, that makes sense. But, but this, do I have to think this? Do I have to believe that? Is that really necessary? Uh, and you couldn't square all of those things up. So, um, so in the end, you, you, you let it go. You turned your back um, on your faith. You turned your back um, on the church. And it, I suppose you turned your back uh, on Jesus. I hear so many stories of people who do this, who lose their faith because of secondary issues. Actually, I very rarely hear people who lose their faith because of primary issues, because of fundamental issues. It's this other stuff that we add in and we bolt on and we lay on top um, of people. And people think, well, I, I'm not sure, do I, do I have to do that? And the problem is that in their zeal to rid themselves of something unwanted or harmful, they inadvertently rid themselves of something valuable. They inadvertently rid themselves of something that was important. You know, we want to they leave for these secondary issues, but they left the primary issues uh, as well. So the question, which I'm hoping you're still with me and still following me, that is going around your head, is what? Well, how do I know, Chris? How do I know what is primary and what is secondary? How, how do I know what is fundamental and what is peripheral? Well, that's exactly what we're going to do throughout this series. We're going to take uh, a few, t- um, a couple of months actually, to come through some of the, these things, uh, and we're going to create a list of things that we think this is fundamental. This is at the core of what it means to be a faithful follower of, of Jesus. But for now, we're going to start here with this statement. Hang on to baby Jesus. Hang on to baby Jesus. Don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. You know, if we're honest, traditionally the church hasn't always been great at creating space for faith to be questioned. You know, often there's times where we're told, well, we have to believe this because, well, it's just part of who we are. It's just part of the Christian faith. Uh, Even when there's evidence that might point to other things, we're not given space or room to actually ask some of those big questions. That's why Alpha is so important. That's why we love to do Alpha at FBC, because it's a place where you can ask those big questions. It's a place where any question can be asked. It's a place where there is no such thing as as dumb or stupid question, because every question um, is valid. Every question um, is valuable. But, but the church hasn't always been good at that. And, and sometimes the church in general has expected people just to believe what they believe, expect people to go along uh, with what they go along, without creating space for people to ask the question, why? Why do we think that? Why do we believe that? Why do we do that? Why do we say that? Why do we practice uh, those sort of things? And, and the challenge with that, that, that when, when you have a faith uh, that, that can't be questioned, you know, when you come to that stage in life and, and you start to question life, you start to ask that question, why? And why do we think this? Why do we believe this? Why do we, why do, we do that? As we grow up, our faith doesn't grow up with us because, you know, we ask these questions about other aspects of life and, and we grow and we mature. But, but if we can't do that in our faith, our faith doesn't grow, our faith doesn't mature. And, and the reality is, a faith that can't be questioned 
can't be trusted. A faith that can't be questioned can't be trusted. And this is a big reason why, by, why many people lose their faith. This is a big reason why many people stall in their faith. They get stuck in their faith because they come across something and think, well, why is that? Why do we think that? Why do we believe that? Why do we do that? And question it. And maybe they've come up against a tradition where actually, no, well, you just got to think that. It just, it's because it is. Because it says so. Uh, and you can't question th- those things. Uh, and maybe that's your story. You, you had questions and, and you found that you couldn't question them. You couldn't wrestle with them. You had doubts that you couldn't um, explore. But you couldn't just go along with it. You couldn't just um, tow the party line. So you left it. You turned your back on the Christian tradition because you couldn't square all of the stuff that you were told you had to square with the worldview that you had. You know, a faith that cannot be questioned cannot be trusted. A deity that cannot be challenged cannot be trusted. A scripture that cannot be examined cannot be trusted. But the good news is that we have a faith that can be questioned. We have a faith that is strong enough, that's robust enough to withstand scrutiny. We have a God who surpasses our doubts. And we have a Bible that is open to thorough examination. So that's why this question is so important. What must I believe in order to be a faithful follower of of Jesus? You get to ask this question. We're going to share some of those things that we think, actually, this is fundamental. This is core to the Christian faith. Or, to put it another way, what's baby and what's bathwater? So that's set the scene for where we're going for the next couple of months. This is why we're doing this. This is why it's important. And we're going to start with that first thing. How do we hang on to baby Jesus? And to do so, we're going to go back um, to AD 30. And at this point in history, there is no church. There is no, no Bible. There is no Christian theology. Uh, there's no doctrine. There's no Christians. There's just the writing of the law and, and the prophets. There's the Jewish temple. There's Roman occupation, and there's this unexpected, unusual Jewish rabbi from a backwater place called Nazareth who's gathering large crowds wherever he goes. And we're going to drop in in a conversation that, that Jesus, this, this rabbi, had with his followers um, and his first disciples. And it, it's sort of like a light bulb moment um, for them. We're going to pick up the conversation in Matthew's Gospel. Matthew is one of the people um, who wrote some of these biographical accounts of the life of Jesus that we find at the start of the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and, and John. Uh, and it's about halfway through Matthew's Gospel, and it's, it's a turning point uh, for them because it's sort of like an aha moment. They, they finally understand who Jesus really is. They finally understand what is fundamental to being a follower um, of their their rabbi. And so Jesus has taken them on a field trip. Uh, They're um, about 30 miles north of of Galilee in a place called Caesarea Philippi. And, And this is the conversation. So when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say the Son of Man is? Now, the Son of Man um, is is a phrase that Jesus used to describe himself. It actually um, is a title that comes from the book of Daniel. Daniel uh, was a prophet um, in the Old Testament. There's books by the prophets, and and Daniel uh, used this phrase, Son of Man, um, as sort of as a title to one that God would give authority over all the nations, you know, God's final king. Uh, So the Son of Man comes from the book of Daniel, and and Jesus uses that title to describe himself. I'm the Son of Man. You know, I'm the one that God has given all authority over the nations to. I am God's final king. It's either extremely arrogant or it's true. And the answer to this question is important. It's fundamental to our faith. They replied, well, some say John the Baptist, and Others say Elijah, and others say Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. Elijah and Jeremiah are, are, again, prophets from the Old Testament. And basically, you know, there's great confusion from the people over who Jesus is. They're not sure. They recognize that there's something special um, about Jesus. They recognize that there's something different um, about Jesus. But they don't know who he is. And then Jesus changes tact in the conversation. I imagine he looks them in the eye and he says this, but what about you, he asked. Who do you say I am? You know, sometimes it's easier to answer this question on behalf of other people. This is what people think, and this is what people say. But what about you? 
You know, he looked at, he looked at them one by one, perhaps, and said, who do you say I am? And this is an interesting place for Jesus to ask this question, um, because Caesarea Philippi is a very religious place. It's a place that's focused on the worship to, to a bunch of, of gods and other deities. There's a sanctuary to Baal there. Baal um, is actually a collection of gods that originated with the, the Canaanites. It's a place where Jeroboam, a king from the Old Testament, built an altar with golden calves and, and declared them as the, the, the gods that brought um, Israel out of the nation of Egypt, if you remember that story, and Moses crossing the Red Sea and all those sort of stuff. Uh, there's a temple to Zeus, the Greek god Zeus. There, there's even a temple be- built um, for Caesar Augustus. And there's, there's temples and, and shrines to a bunch of other gods all over the place. It's a very religious uh, place. And one of these um, temples or shrines is uh, a shrine to the god Pan, the pagan god Pan. And it's actually a, a, a grotto, a cave uh, behind the temple to Caesar Augusto. And, and in this grotto, in this cave, is this bottomless pool of water which actually wasn't bottomless, but they thought it was bottomless. It was so deep. And they thought that this was, the, they called it the gates of Hades, um, the gates of hell. Uh, they thought it was the entrance to the underworld. It's a very spiritual place, a very religious place. Um, so in the context of all of these things, and maybe as, as Jesus was standing there, and they could see these temples, and they could see these, these shrines uh, to all these other gods, Jesus says to them, but what about you? Who do you say I am? And Simon Peter answered, you're the Messiah. You're the son of the living God. This is a massive statement uh, for uh, Peter to make. This is a dangerous thing to say. This is a blasphemous thing to say that that Jesus is the Messiah, that Jesus is the son uh, of God. Actually, it could have resulted in execution. It could have resulted in them being stoned uh, to death. But also, it was a threat to Caesar. You know, the temple built to Caesar Augustus there. Caesar thinks that he is God. And, you know, Peter's saying to Jesus, you're the Messiah, you're the son of the living God. You are God's final king. It's sort of a a push back against the authority of Rome and the occupation uh, that that Rome is. And this is a turning point because Peter finally understands Jesus is more than just a rabbi. Jesus is more than just an an interesting teacher who who says things that that nobody has ever said before or a way that, that nobody said. There's something special. There's something unique. There's something powerful in who Jesus is. He's the Messiah, the one that the nation of Israel had been waiting for for generations to rescue them and redeem them and restore them to be this great nation. You're also the son of God. You are, you're divine. And Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. You know, Jesus is saying, you're smart, Simon, but you're not that smart. You didn't figure this out by yourself. You didn't put all these things together. This was revealed to you by my Father. The interesting thing is that Jesus didn't say, didn't rebuke um, Simon for saying this. He didn't say, no, you can't say, you can't say that. He's like, yes, that is who I am. I am the Messiah. I am the Son of the living God. I am the Son of Man. I am God's final King. He affirms that statement. He affirms that title. He says, yes, this is me. This is who I am. This is who you are following. And Jesus makes, the, um, Peter's made this declaration, Simon Peter, we'll get to that in a minute. Uh, and, and Jesus makes this declaration uh, back to him. And he says, and I tell you that you are Peter. You know, Jesus changes his his name, his name was Simon. And he says, no, I'm going to change your name. You're now Peter. And Peter, the Greek word Petros mean, means rock. And he says, on this rock, I will build my church. On this rock of what you said, on this rock of declaration, on this fundamental principle that I am the Messiah, that I am the son of the living God, that I am the son of man, that I am God's final king, I'm going to build my church church. This is foundation, uh, foundational to the Christian faith. This is fundamental to the Christian faith. Everything is built upon this principle. Everything is built on this belief that Jesus is the Messiah, that Jesus is God's Son, that Jesus is our King. And he says, and the gates of Hades 
will not overcome it. The gates of hell will not overcome it. And I imagine that Jesus pointing to all these religious symbols and spiritual um, shrines and temples, to all these uh, other gods. And he says, you see all of this? You see all of this culture? You see all of this tradition? See all of this heritage? See all of the stuff of this world that's around us? All of this, all this, all of this stuff here? It will not stand against my church. It will not overcome my church. They won't stand against me, and they won't stand against you. Because this fundamental principle that you are the Messiah, that Peter said, that you are the Son of the living God, is fundamental to our faith. It's foundational. And actually, of those 45,000 denominations, Christian denominations that I talked about earlier, this is the only thing that we've all agreed on since the beginning. That Jesus is the Messiah. That Jesus is the Son of the living God. Now this statement organizes and prioritizes everything else that follows. So as we start our exploration of, of trying to figure out well, what is fundamental, what is, what is um, primary, and, and what's cultural, what's, what's peripheral, what's central, uh, secondary, you know, what are the things that are at the core um, of the Christian faith? What must I believe in order to be a faithful follower of Jesus? Well, we start with this. Jesus is God's son and our king. We're going to get the band back up on stage just as we wrap up uh, this time. You know, this is where we start. Everything else that we, that we talk about throughout this series flows from this statement that Jesus is God's son and that Jesus is our king. Everything else is built upon this foundation. Everything else is built upon this principle. This is fundamental to our faith. And let's go back to that conversation that Jesus had uh, with his followers. Who do you say I am? He asked them, and Peter was the one that was brave enough to answer the question. But what about you? You know, I imagine that Jesus stands before each and every one of us, and he looks each and every one of us in the eye, and he says, well, what about you? Who do you say that I am? We have to get this right. This is so important because everything else flows from this. If we get this wrong and then we think, well, Jesus is this, Everything else is built upon that. And, it, and if we get this wrong, everything else in our fundamental list will be wrong. We'll be, be off kilter. That will be off in a, in a wrong direction. Jesus says that I am the Son of God. I am the Messiah. I am uh, the Son of Man. I am God's final King. He's the Son of God. He's God's Son. And He's our King. And are you at a point where you believe in that? Or have you still got questions? Well, how do I know that, that to be true? If you're in that place, you're thinking, well, I'm not sure uh, about that. Again, Alpha is a great place uh, for you to, to ask some of those questions, to explore some of those, those principles. And as we go throughout this series, we're going to pick up uh, right here uh, next week on the fundamental list. We're going to explore what are these fundamental principles that helps me know what I must believe in order to be a faithful follower of Jesus. Because when we get that right, what we do flows from that belief. And hopefully we can recover the essentials of our faith. Let's stand together. Let's pray together. Father God, I thank you so much uh, for Jesus, for who he is, for what he is about, for what he has done and for what he continues to do. And Lord, we acknowledge that Jesus is God's son. He's your son and he's our king. And I pray that you'd help us have faith and courage to put him there. And Lord, if we've got questions and if we're not sure uh, about that, if we can't come to that point where we can acknowledge or declare that principle, Lord, give us the courage to explore that, to check that out, to ask those questions, to examine it, um, to delve into it. But for those of us who are, want to be followers of Jesus, help us to acknowledge that he's our Lord, that he's our Savior, that he is our King, and to orientate our lives around him. Bless us, Lord. Amen.